Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please switch your cell phones off. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the Diplomatic and Consular Corps, distinguished visitors and guests, all protocols observed, welcome. I would like to welcome you this evening on behalf of the F.W. de Klerk Foundation and Elita de Klerk. F.W. de Klerk died exactly one year ago today. He left us in the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. the hour that is celebrated as ever since the end of the Second, First World War as the hour of peace. In the period following his death, our foundation considered how best we could honor his legacy. We decided to establish an F.W. de Klerk archive and library we also decided to create a permanent multimedia exhibition on the constitutional transformation of South Africa, which was the centerpiece and crowning achievement of his presidency. <clears throat> Finally, we thought that we would institute an annual F.W. de Klerk Memorial Lecture on the anniversary of his death. We felt that one of the best ways to commemorate his work would be to invite a distinguished speaker each year to address one of the topics that inspired and motivated F.W. de Klerk during and after his presidency. These topics included the constitutional transformation of South Africa, the centrality of the Constitution, the rule of law, and the Bill of Rights to the future success of South Africa, the accommodation of diversity in multicultural and multilingual societies, the resolution of intractable problems in conflicted societies, and nuclear disarmament. We could think of no one who, would, who was better placed to deliver the inaugural memorial lecture than Lord Rennick of Clifton. Robin Rennick was educated at St. Paul's School, at Cambridge, and the Sorbonne. He joined the British Foreign Service in 1963. He served in Senegal, India, and Paris, he was the British ambassador in South Africa between the critical years, between 1987 and 1991. And then he was the British ambassador to Washington between 1991 and 1995, the plum post in the foreign, for British Foreign Office. He was created a Knight Commander of St. George, by St. Michael and St. George in the 1989 honors list and in September 1997, he was elevated to the peerage as Lord, Lord Rennick of Clifton. As the British ambassador to South Africa during that critical period of our history, he had an unparalleled vantage point from which to observe the beginning of the constitutional transformation of South Africa. He had the opportunity of getting to know and interact with all of the principal players, with Nelson Mandela, with Bangasuta Butelezi, with F.W. de Klerk, and many, many others. And from time to time, he was able to give the process a helpful nudge in the right direction. It is now my honor 
to call on Lord Rennick to deliver the inaugural F.W. de Klerk Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Elita, uh, John, Leader of the Opposition, Jordan, Mr. Mayor, Helen, Tully, and ladies and gentlemen. I am very honored to have been asked to give the first memorial lecture in honor of a true statesman responsible for the first democratic elections in the history of this country, responsible also for the termination of South Africa's nuclear weapons program, the only country ever to renounce its own nuclear weapons, plus abolition of the death penalty, a thoroughly deserved winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, universally admired in the rest of the world, Afia de Klerk. I'm especially happy to do so in the presence of Elita de Klerk, who brought her husband great happiness over many years, and of a fierce son, Jan. When I came to South Africa in 1987, the ANC leaders were in jail or in exile. Thousands of people were in prison without trial. The United Democratic Front was about to be banned, and agents of the security police and of military intelligence were being encouraged to take out, that is to say, murder, opponents of the regime. You were facing the prospect of ever-increasing sanctions and international isolation and ever-increasing violence at home. One of my first calls was on Vef Dier de Klerk, Minister of Higher Education and leader of the National Party in the Transvaal. He was, I was told, a deeply conservative figure, having been brought up as the son of a National Party senator and educated in the ultra-conservative University of Potchefstroom. I recall that when the authorities there banned dancing on campus, as this could lead to sex, the, stu <laughs> the students' union debated whether meant this meant that sex was also banned. <laughs> um, they concluded that it was, as that could lead to dancing. <laughs> Elfia represented the very conservative constituency of Ferenigan. Interestingly, however, Helen Sussman, my closest friend in South Africa, told me that Afia had invited her to address his constituents there. He'd said that he didn't agree with her, but thought that they should hear her views. Helen had a soft spot for Afia, who she told me was a decent human being. She enjoyed congratulating him later, she said, for having made the same speeches I made 20 years ago. <laughs> In my first meeting with Ophir, noting that I'd been in Rhodesia, he said, I want you to know that if I have my way, we will not make the same mistake they did. What was the mistake, I asked? Leaving it far too late to negotiate with the real black leaders, was his reply. When the United Democratic Front then was banned, Johann Rupert and I had dinner that evening with Ophir at the Mount Nelson Hotel. He hadn't been consulted, he said, and would have opposed the ban. Things would be very different, done very differently if he took over. When Afia did take over from PW as leader of the National Party, I arranged for him to meet Margaret Thatcher, who promised him full support from her if he released Mandela and abolished apartheid. How far do you think he will go, she asked me after the meeting. Further than most people think, was my reply. The skeptics included even his very valichter brother, Wimpy, who told me that he feared that his brother was too conservative to make a good president. I said that he must know his brother better than I did, but I thought Ifia would prove him wrong. And he did so immediately. Desmond Tutu promised me and others that the churches would marshal the huge demonstration planned in Cape Town if we could help to get it authorized which wasn't really necessary, as that was, as that was what Afia wanted to do anyway. He had made a remarkable speech to the leaders of the South African police, in which he said that the status quo could only be maintained by killing thousands more people. And when the shooting stops, the problem will be exactly the same as when it started. 
At midnight before his historic speech on 2 February 1990, unbanning the ANC and paving the way for the release of Mandela and his colleagues, Afvia telephoned me to say, you can tell your Prime Minister that she will not be disappointed. I'm sure that this audience doesn't need reminding who abolished apartheid. Apartheid wasn't abolished by Nelson Mandela, though he made a fundamental contribution to doing so, but by Afvia de Klerk. It was de Klerk who removed from the statute book every apartheid law, including the Population Registration Act, cornerstone of the entire system. Afia de Klerk's intention in setting his country on a completely different path was to give South Africa, as he put it, the chance of a new beginning. Nelson Mandela, with whom I also had numerous meetings at the time, had precisely the same intention. Mandela, on one occasion, urged me to join the ANC, quotes, because you think like us, unquote. I told him that I thought like him, but not like others in his party. <laughs> A lot has been achieved since then. Millions more people have access to drinkable water and formal housing, and even, though now episodically, to electricity than they did in 1994. Above all, a new beginning has been accomplished in the most important respect of all, as all South Africans now live in a genuinely multiracial, far more normal society than could ever be the case under apartheid. This was the deepest held ambition of de Klerk and Mandela alike, and it has been realized. Mandela was right also in foreseeing that sport, loved by nearly all South Africans, could be a unifying factor. Not only that, but Afia's other great cause was respect for and protection of the Constitution and the ideal of a state based on the rule of law. That too, to date, has been achieved with the judges, a free press, and the non-governmental organizations combining to help defeat Jacob Zuma's persistent attempts to undermine the rule of law. You have an admirable new Chief Justice who most certainly will defend the Constitution. You have Halema Motlanti representing the values of the old guard of the ANC. You had in Tuli Madoncella, a public protector to whom all of you owe a huge debt of gratitude today. The less said about her successor, the better. Defense of the Constitution remains the great cause of the F.W. de Klerk Foundation of a fierce alter ego David Stewart, and of other like-minded NGOs. What I have just mentioned is the reason none of you should ever give up on the conviction that the country can and will do much better than it is doing now. For as my friend John Carlin and I, whenever we deplore some new uh, <coughs> mistake, or in our view, being made here, we always say to each other, this is a magnificent country and not only or just in its physical splendor and resources, but in the extraordinary quality of people of all races and walks of life within it. You will overcome, as thanks to two great leaders, you managed to do in far worse circumstances before. Think of Tuli Madoncella, whose reports, published at great risk to her, did more than anything to end the corrupt regime of Jacob Zuma. You may recall my favorite cartoon by my favorite satirist, Zapiro, of Zuma under attack from Tuli, lying on the ground and saying, it's only a flesh wound. <coughs> Tis but a scratch in Monty Python language, when in fact he was fatally wounded. So please join me in thanking her right now for what she did. Now, we all know that none of those responsible for the theft of an estimated $14 billion, Travin Gordon's estimate, not mine, from the state-owned enterprises have yet been convicted. But, the, but, but those responsible 
are now at last being pursued by a new public prosecutor, Shamila Bathohi, and Previn, who fought valiantly against all that theft, has removed all those responsible from the leadership of, this, of the SOEs, though it is proving much harder to eradicate endemic corruption in them at other levels. Paloma Patlanti's statement that we did not join the ANC to get rich, we joined it to go to jail, summarizes the problem of liberation movements growing old. Instead of having to make the huge sacrifices of the leaders I knew, of Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Ahmed Katrada, and others of that generation, a different generation, imagine that they then are entitled to go on enjoying the fruits of office indefinitely. The results are there for all to see in some of your neighbors. As you have genuinely free elections, that shouldn't happen here. So what are the respects in which South Africa very obviously is in need of a new beginning? Let's start with education. Clearly things have not worked out as Mandela and Afia had hoped. Mandela would be absolutely distraught at the fact that basic state education remains scarcely any better than it was in the era of Bantu education, with South Africa currently ranking among the very lowest numeracy and literacy rates in Africa. This is what should concern us all most of all, for there could be no more catastrophic failure than this. It's no use pretending to care deeply about the poor and the disadvantaged if they're denied the opportunity to be educated and thereby to develop skills that help them to live a normal life and get a job. The reason for this abysmal performance is well known. The teachers' union, aligned with the ruling party, will not permit any performance teaching testing of the teachers, a vast number of whom do not have any skills and cannot be dismissed, even though an alarming number of them don't even bother to turn up for work. How can this be permitted to continue? Please ask any party standing in the next election what they intend to do about it. Mandela would be, and I fear was no less distressed at the fact that, nearly 30 years on, unemployment is worse than ever, approaching 40%. Being able to earn one's living is a vitally important element in human dignity, and mass unemployment is a mass breeding ground for crime. It leads, for instance, to the infrastructure theft that is contributing to the crippling of the economy. The government's solution to this, or the party's solution to this, is to think of replacing the social grants on which currently a staggering number of 18 million people depend by a basic income grant, which is liable to prove unaffordable and which anyway will not solve the problem, which can only be solved by creating employment. In Britain, we have just managed, thank goodness, to get rid of a prime minister who also believed in fantasy economics, to be replaced by someone who doesn't. The most vivid demonstration of incompetence affecting all South Africans has been the so-called load shedding, in reality power cuts, crippling also the economy. This has been an entirely self-inflicted fiasco as successive ANC energy ministers, including the present one, have fought tooth and nail against the only possible solution, which was to permit the private sector to make up the power deficit that the government can't. For longer than I can remember, the miners and other private companies have been demanding to generate the right to generate their own power and to sell any surplus to the grid. Here at least, there is some reason to be hopeful as the government, in the end, has had to give in to economic reality. The independent power producers will help to fill the power deficit, though not probably for several more frustrating years. Despite the surge in commodity prices, mining output and the numbers employed in mining have been shrinking steadily here, due partly to declining grades, but just as much to the performance of the Department of Mineral Affairs. 
Those wanting to invest in mining in South Africa have experienced from them, especially under Zuma, such a combination of arrogance, incompetence, and corruption that South Africa is currently rated in the bottom 10 of countries in the world in attractiveness for mining investment. The delays in obtaining permits remain never ending. Despite the country's massive mineral resources, South Africa currently is attracting less than 1% of world expenditure on exploration, while due to the dire state of Transnet, the miners are unable to get all their export production to and through the ports. <coughs> According to innumerable audit reports, a host of ANC government municipalities have failed the most elementary requirements in terms of service delivery, while regions like the Eastern Cape have become bywords for the failure of basic services, including health. The fact that so many of these <coughs> municipalities do not pay their electricity bills has compounded ESCOM's problems. Mandela was genuinely colorblind, and the old ANC, or true ANC I knew and admired so much, were committed to non-racialism. Positive transformation depends on the accelerated training of hitherto disadvantaged South Africans to gain management skills. And more of that certainly does need to take place. But today, the government, dissatisfied with its lack of control over the private sector, is about to mandate that employment must reflect the makeup of the population, thereby introducing racial quotas on a massive scale, irrespective of qualifications or competence, mirroring the disaster inflicted on ESCOM by encouraging the departure of large numbers of competent engineers because they were the wrong color. Given the draconian penalties for non-compliance, DISCAM is not going to be alone in calling a halt to the recruitment of white South Africans. The possibly unintended effect will be to reinforce the conviction of well-qualified young white professionals that they are going to be disadvantaged, causing you to suffer a further loss of skills as they are sought after elsewhere. We have at present 250,000 approximately South Africans in Britain and will expect to have to welcome more. Meanwhile, Andre de Reuter, a highly competent CEO, appointed as head of ESCOM to cope with the mess inherited from his predecessors, comes under attack, among other things, as being too pale for such a task. When Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, which posed no conceivable threat to Moscow, now Lady Pandor condemned it, only to be disavowed by the presidency in response to remonstrances from the Russian ambassador. Russian threats to use nuclear weapons against Ukraine have met with no condemnation from your government, while at the UN, your spokesmen have been suggesting that the invasion may have been justified. Does South Africa really not object to the threatened use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine? China has condemned Putin's nuclear threats. How about you? Your president shortly will be embarking on a state visit to the United Kingdom, where there is a fund of goodwill towards this country and towards him personally, but not on this issue. Your economy is forecast to grow at less than 2% per annum over the next three years. Such low rates of growth render it impossible to improve living standards overall. When it comes to economic growth, in the words of your poet Roy Campbell, I can see the snaffle and the bit, all right, but where's the bloody horse? In a mixed economy, the main engine of growth has to be the private sector, which alone can create jobs which pay for themselves, rather than depending on never-ending bailouts. The determination to cling to state control makes sense only if you have a competent state which, comma, except in the Reserve Bank and the National Treasury, doesn't exist in South Africa. No one who has been obliged to struggle with the rest of your bureaucracy will feel able to contest this. 
This problem of competence, or the lack of it, was compounded by the ANC doctrine of deployment, ensuring that a vast number of people in the swollen bureaucracy, all the state ages, agencies, and the state-owned enterprises are unqualified or underqualified for the positions they hold. In his last State of the Union address, the President said that the task of the government is to create the conditions that will enable the private sector to emerge, to grow, to access new markets, to create new products, and to hire more employees. He also declared that jobs are created by business, not government. From 1994 to 2008, under Mandela and Mbeki, pro-growth policies were pursued, and your economy was growing at around 4%, unemployment was down to half the level it is now, only for those policies to then to be abandoned under Zuma, and not yet really resumed since. Current pessimism in South Africa could easily be overcome if the president actually felt able to do what he has said, but that would require a change both of people and of policies. Appointments would need to be made on merit rather than to satisfy the various factions in the party. If the president's idea is to partner with business, it would be desirable to appoint ministers who actually believe in doing so. Achieving more rapid economic growth also would require a change of policies. As with the National Party, when FW became its leader, the ANC has within it many volectors who genuinely want to change the direction of the country and return to the values of Mandela, Tambo, Tambo and Sisulu. But it also has within it, as with the National Party, just as many Verkrampters who want things to continue as they are or to align more with the economic freedom fighters who want to tear up the Constitution. <coughs> the kind of radical economic transformation they advocate when tried elsewhere has resulted only in radical mass impoverishment, though not, of course, for the leaders. According to Julius Malema, on his return from holidaying on a yacht in Ibiza, they believe that violence will be necessary to achieve transformation. Allying with or seeking to emulate them would render you uninvestable, thereby achieving for you a Venezuela state style outcome but without the oil. The chances of any improvement will depend on overcoming the ANC's resistance to the private sector and addiction to state-owned enterprises that have failed, which proves so easy for the Guptas to loot and will go on failing unless private sector help is enlisted to save them. Since public and private sector partnerships have become the norm around the world, it's bizarre to find them untried to any significant degree in South Africa. The addiction to failing SOEs is attributed to a commitment to so socialism. But the other, and maybe even bigger reason, is rather the patronage they confer on the state and hence the party. A classic example of this decline is that of Transnet. Apart from increasing problems with the rail network, they proved incapable of operating South African ports to anything like international standards. The turnaround times for loading and unloading shipping are dismally as compared, for instance, with Maputo, which, you know, right next door, which, like many other African ports, is operated by Dubai World and Grindrod. South African miners have been reduced to diverting huge volumes of traffic by road to Maputo. So why not rescue Transnet? It's no use complaining about things. What about solutions? So why not rescue Transnet by inviting first-class port operators and logistics exports, experts like Grindrod, based right here in Durban, to help to manage South African ports as they're doing successfully elsewhere? And why not allow the mining companies to play a leading role in helping to finance and operate the main coal and iron ore export lines as they do in Australia. Such ideas, of course, will provoke cries of horror and be just as fiercely resisted as independent power producers were, but they will end up having to be aggrieved as you are fast approaching as, as desperate a state for Transnet as for ESCOM. 
The state would continue to own the infrastructure, but this would represent the kind of state and private sector partnership that could help to unleash growth and to overcome economic stagnation. But instead of setting out a plan to improve its performance at the mining in Darbo in Johannesburg, the established miners all were told by Transnet, to their astonishment, that when their contracts are renewed, they will be required to give up 30 to 40 percent of their transport allocations to, quotes, new emerging companies, unquote. So all the mining houses, in fact, are being told to get ready to cut their production by that amount, which obviously could lead to major job losses. So how on earth does that make sense? And how on earth could small companies manage to fill that gap? It is the world upside down. It is blindingly obvious that to promote new entrants, Transnet needs to increase its own capacity. A glimmer of hope is said now to exist in the prospects for offshore oil exploration and production, which also has been delayed interminably by the Department of Energy, while Mozambique has forged ahead and Namibia has been trying to. How can it make sense for South Africa to continue, almost alone in doing so, in making it difficult for international oil and gas companies to help the country to benefit from its offshore oil and gas reserves, including the tax revenues that would result from doing so? Of course you need the right environmental standards. It still doesn't make sense to you know, impede so, so effectively people actually getting on with exploration and production. A further reason for hope has been the demonstration by your Premier, Alan Wibinder, and his colleagues in the Western Cape that the dream of better government is not a mirage, but definitely achievable, which was the case also under Helen Zilla. It's not my opinion, but a fact attested by all of the relevant audit reports that service delivery in the Democratic Alliance controlled municipalities has been markedly better than in those controlled by others. We all know about the party's travails in working with black South African figures, but it's impossible to dispute their success in government or their achievements in working with rather than against the business community. The results have been an impressive performance by the Western Cape economy to such an extent that there has been a new trek, this time in the opposite direction, back from the Transvaal to the Cape. The ANC will try hard to avoid a coalition with the DA, and that may be mutual, but unless your government adopts genuinely pro-business policies more like theirs, you will never achieve a significant reduction in un unemployment or growth in the incomes of all South Africans. Cyril Ramaphosa, a long-standing friend of mine and of many of us here, no doubt, is likely to be re-elected as president next year. He is by nature a conciliator, though he had the courage to save you all from five more years of Jacob Zuma, when not many thought he could win. Many of his more hopeful supporters have been disappointed by his performance since, which keeps being explained as due to the fact that he is a prisoner of his party but at last he has asserted himself over independent power producers. Without him, his party would fare worse electorally, so let's hope that he will start asserting himself on other issues. But your hopes of a better future also will depend on the reputable opposition parties uniting behind the need to defend the Constitution and cooperating more effectively nationally, not just locally, to offer a more credible alternative a never-ending rule by the same party, regardless of its performance. The opposition parties have some important points in common in their critique of the status quo. Do not share the obsession with state control and need to form some sort of common front or coalition, not only locally. If they wish to avoid the ruling party on losing its majority, simply seeking to co-opt a smaller party or two without changing policies. Ruling parties are only likely to reform themselves when threatened by a loss of power or after it. It would be wise to hurry up 
as we are witnessing the struggles of a once great ruling party with its then great leaders, which, unless it changes course, as I hope it will, will continue fading. And post Cyril, whose presence tend, tends to act, mask its difficulties, it could find itself falling dramatically in popular support. Now, F.W. de Klerk took over as president in South Africa in far more difficult circumstances than these. To take the country in a completely new direction, to one person, one vote, he had to overcome those in his party and in his community who wanted the status quo to continue unchanged and to face down also the deep-rooted opposition to it within the armed forces and the police. I recall the amazement of my friends in the ANC when he made the speech which changed South Africa forever in February 1990. In doing so, as I told Mandela, I fear knew that he was going to be negotiating himself out of power. Many seem to have forgotten how difficult and turbulent a process it was he then had to negotiate. With the ANC leaders asking me about the dangers of a coup, and General Constant Viltuen telling General Mehring that they could take over the country in one day. Yes, said Mehring, fortunately, but what would we do then? But if fear never wavered in his determination to see the process he had started through. You've turned out not to be very good at respecting the achievements of this true statesman, a truly great and good man who by his actions saved the lives of an immense number of South Africans, black and white. The best apology for apartheid was to abolish it, and with Mandela, to give a chance, this country the chance of a new beginning, which you have still to make the most of yet. During this extremely difficult and violent transition, with a vast amount of violence between the ANC and Encarta, and incitement to violence by the third force elements in military intelligence and the police, I would find Fvir chain smoking at the time in his office in Pretoria or the chain house, remaining calm and determined to get to the next stage in negotiations. As Mandela, on behalf of his party, was claiming that the violence had nothing to do with the ANC, I showed him a photo of youths in ANC t-shirts necklacing a Zulu hospital dweller in Soweto. Mandela, who was nothing if not fair-minded, ended up declaring that we are just as responsible for the violence of others. And since I'm mentioning Mandela, I'd just like to say that some of the portraits I see of him these days are not quite accurate in my humble opinion. Uh, he's always depicted as some kind of a saint. As his grandson will testify, he also was one of the craftiest and wildest politicians I have ever known. He would make extremely aggressive speeches, and when I went to see them and he realized I didn't like them, he would tell me not to worry, because by implication at least, they were for the youth in his own party, not for grown-ups to be <laughs> not to be taken seriously too seriously by by grown-ups. That's what he was like. He also his his whole technique was to capture his opponent. He started by by recruiting his warder as his servant. Uh, he then he moved on to the justice minister Kobe Katsia, who rushed up to me one day and said please help me to get Mandela released. He was supposed to be keeping him in jail. <laughs> when it came to Margaret Thatcher, uh, Man the ANC wanted to fight with Thatcher. Uh, Ma uh, Mandela's view was completely the op precisely the opposite. Tell me how I can get her on my side, he, he, he said to me. Uh, so when he went to see her, I told her, please remember that he's waited 27 years to tell you his side of the story. You mean I mustn't interrupt, she said. And I said, well, please not. And she anyhow, didn't interrupt. She heard the whole story. And they got on extremely well because she genuinely was against apartheid. So well, the meeting went on for three hours. And the British press in Downing Street outside started chanting, 
free Nelson Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> As I was leaving South Africa, Mandela attended my farewell party, much to my surprise. He just made a speech breaking off negotiations. I said that this was a mistake they needed to be accelerated. Don't worry, he said. I intend to work everything out with de Klerk. Later, when he was president, he made an absurd statement that he'd preferred dealing with P.W. Botha. I was so annoyed by this that I went to see him in the Tyne House. I told him that, in that same office, I had been obliged to argue with P.W. Botta for people's lives, notably those of the Sharpeville Six. On each occasion, I had argued also for Mandela's release, only to find that P.W. had no intention whatever of releasing him, as he knew that he would then lose control. Please remember, I said, that but for de Klerk, he would still be in jail. Mandela, roaring with laughter, said that this was right. <laughs> Not long before the first one-person, one-vote election in 1994, de Klerk was invited by the London Times Group to make a speech in London's huge Albert Hall. He was a world hero at the time, as he remains internationally to this day. He received a standing ovation before he spoke and again when he finished. There were questions at the end, one of them from a black South African. His father, he said, had been taken away by the security police, and so had his brother. There was a moment of tension, as nobody knew what was coming next. What came next was, so I am thanking God for the day you were born. One of the, when it came to the Nobel Prizes, one of the most revered senior members of the ANC said to me that de, de Klerk had so thoroughly deserved his Nobel Prize that maybe he should receive it even before Mandela, for he made peace possible. Please remember those words. He made peace possible. So let's please give this truly great man the respect he deserves. And let's see whether your present day leaders have the courage, as F. Veer did, to change the course the country's been on to a more promising one, based on encouraging the private sector, as the president has said he's wanted, he wants to do, to partner with government and to take on more of the tasks the less competent state agencies have proved unable to perform, the alternative being uh, hardly any growth. Pro-growth policies have been tried and worked before, so why on earth not try them again? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would now like to call on Elita de Klerk to say a few words of thanks. Lord Rennick, thank you so much. It was a great speech, but sobering speech. Thinking of FW, he always, when he spoke, he tried to speak about the glass half full. And I was trying to find where is the glass half full here? Because it was a bit depressing. <laughs> but we take note and um, South Africa is a wonderful country, and South Africans are wonderful people. And we will conquer whatever is happening. May, on behalf of the foundation, 
give you a little momentum we have for you. Thank you, Alita. Uh, the formal proceedings are now over. Uh, we are going to have a cocktail reception outside, and I hope everybody can enjoy themselves and, and think about what Lord Rennick has said. <laughs> the speech, uh, some copies will, are available here, but it will also be available immediately on our website at www fwdeclerk.org. Thank you very much for joining us this evening in this first uh, F.W. de Klerk Memorial Lecture. We hope to see you in future years as well. Thank you.